Hey 6303, hopefully you've taken a little bit of a brain break since you watched the last video on quality quantitative design. You'll notice this video doesn't have as much complex vocabulary as the quantitative one, but that doesn't mean qualitative research is any less rigorous than the quantitative research. The work you put in just comes in different parts of the study. For quantitative, the brunt of the work is in the design and in ensuring reliability and validity. For qualitative, the brunt of the work is in collecting and analyzing the data, which can become quite rigorous. So in this video, we're going to talk to you about more design elements for qualitative research. Here are the objectives. Identify instruments used to collect data in qualitative studies. Discuss the researcher's role in data collection and analysis. Identify analysis techniques and software programs used to analyze data. Identify methods to maintain rigor in qualitative studies. The instruments we use to collect data in a qualitative study are very different from those we use in quantitative studies. In fact, there are four basic types of qualitative data collection, as stated in Cresswell's Chapter 9. Observations, interviews, documents, and audiovisual materials. This chart tells the advantages and limitations of each type. And if you'd like a closer view of this chart, you can download the script from the Module 2 folder directions. You can also find the chart on pages 191 and 192 of the 4th edition Cresswell text, which is available in Blackboard. This brings us to the researcher's role in data collection and analysis. While researchers try to remove as much bias as possible in quantitative studies, researchers in qualitative studies recognize they can never fully separate their bias from how they record and interpret data. The term used for qualitative studies is subjectivity. It is where the researcher identifies how personal histories, cultural worldviews, and professional experiences may affect everything from the choice of theoretical framework to the design, to the analysis, and finally to the results. Alan Peshkin, an ethnographical researcher from Stanford, describes subjectivity, qualities that have the capacity to filter, skew, shape, block, transform, construe, and misconstrue what transpires from the outset of a research project to its culmination in a written statement. Here is an example of a subjectivity statement from a dissertation titled African American Mother's Perceptions of Quality Child Care by Herman Theodore Knopf. Notice how he recognizes the fact that he is a white middle class male. He is doing this so he becomes aware of his own epistemology, how he knows what he knows, as well as to inform his reader about where his beliefs come from. From the subjectivity statement, the reader can infer Knopf's personal experiences may affect his interpretations of the data he collects from the African American women he interviews. To maintain rigor, qualitative researchers need to be reflexive as they conduct their research. They must inquire about how their role in the study and their personal background, culture, and experiences hold potential for shaping their interpretations. They can do this through journal entries and memos as they collect and analyze the data. Detailing these reflection actions also lets the readers know how the direction of the study was shaped. Here is an example of an analytic memo from my dissertation where I followed a professional songwriter through his songwriting process. This memo I made while I was coding my data actually ended up turning into a theme for this study. If I would not have documented this thought, I likely would have not created the theme. Analytical memos also help the researcher show the reader how connections were made, which increases the researcher's credibility. Hopefully you're starting to notice how the researcher does not attempt to separate themselves from the data in a qualitative study. Instead, they document their assumptions, experiences, etc. all throughout the study. Because the researcher conducts a qualitative study in a natural setting, and attempts to observe natural phenomena, the researcher may become a participant in their own study. For example, I started my study with the songwriter under the assumption that I would just be interviewing and observing him throughout the process. During the interview, I functioned solely as an observer, asking him questions about his process and taking notes along the way. 
but when it came time to observe him actually composing music and lyrics, I found myself questioning whether or not I should participate and help write some of the lines. I did wind up writing some of the lines in the songs and was aware that my participation shaped the results. In my write-up, I made sure to document my role as a participant observer. Here's a video clip from my study where you can see me move from being a hesitant observer to actually participating in the creation of the song. I finally found a way to... What is it that you said? Uh, I said, I finally found the way to say it right. I finally found the way to say it right. You say this. I finally found the way. I know I'm going to say it right because I'm going to sing your favorite song tonight. I finally found the way. I know I'm going to say it right. was a little bit long, but I wanted you to see the elements of a qualitative study. It was happening in a natural setting. The participants were relaxed. I moved from being a an observer to a participant observer, and you'll notice the data collection process was a little bit messy. It wasn't super straightforward. It wasn't an inventory or a survey. There's a lot going on that I had to analyze when I typed up the transcript and did the coding, theming, and categorizing. If you refer back to Cresswell's type of data collection chart, you can see the different ways a researcher can observe in a qualitative study, many of which are very different from a quantitative study. In a qualitative study, the researcher may begin analyzing the data while it was being collected, just like I did in that video that I showed you. This is why making those analytical memos is so important. The researcher can use the current analysis and memos to figure out if questioning or observations need to shift, if more information is needed, etc. At some point in the study, the researcher will begin coding the data. Coding refers to the process of assigning data labels to patterns. There are a plethora of ways and protocols used to code data, but here is a basic description from Dr. Susan Gasson at Drexel University. You want to read through the transcript or data and ask yourself what is going on. You make notes about the themes or patterns that you see in the data, but you're not attempting to be comprehensive or systematic at this point. Then you begin to categorize and code your observations. You're relating categories to codes back to the research question, and you're trying to define what those categories are, what the attribute codes are. You're also defining categories and subcategories, sometimes called families. And you ask yourself, so what? How do all of these relate back to that research question so that you can draw conclusions about what the data tells you? A researcher may complete more than one cycle of coding in an attempt to go in-depth with the analysis and catch important information they might have missed in the first cycle. Eventually, codes get placed into categories and categories get merged into themes. Themes are then written up in the research with the researcher documenting how they arrived at that theme. Coding, categorizing, and theming is a tremendous time investment for the researcher. The more data collected, 
the more time the researcher is going to spend coding. Researchers may choose to use qualitative coding software, such as Deduce or Invivo, to help keep track of the massive amounts of data. Each document, observation, interview, etc. gets uploaded into the software, where the researcher can apply a code. The researcher reads through the data line by line to conduct the analysis, and the software can track how many times a code was applied and how many times the codes interacted. Here's an example of coding using the Deduce software. Notice some lines might have multiple codes applied to them. By now, you've realized qualitative and quantitative research have very different approaches to answering very different styles of research questions. Qualitative research may seem very subjective compared to quantitative, but the researcher can increase rigor and trustworthiness by using the following. Multiple data sources. Qualitative researchers collect more than one piece of data. These forms of data may be multiple interviews conducted over time, interviews combined with artifacts, artifacts mis mixed with observations, etc. As the researcher conducts the analysis on those multiple data sources, they are looking for triangulation, where they analyze multiple data sources to capture different dimensions of the same phenomenon. As the researcher codes, categorizes, and themes the data, they can discuss their findings with the participant and have the participant give feedback on the authenticity of the findings. Member checks can be completed at any time during the data collection and analysis portions of the research process. Peer debriefing, as described by debriefing.com, requires the researcher to work together with one or several colleagues who hold impartial views of the study. The impartial peers examine the researcher's transcripts, transcripts final report, and general methodology. Afterwards, feedback is provided to enhance credibility and ensure validity. Through the investigation, the peers may detect the following problems in the research. Overemphasized points, underemphasized points, vague descriptions, general errors in the data, biases or assumptions made by the researcher. The peer debriefing will also help the researcher become more aware of his or her own views regarding the data. All of these elements help ensure trustworthiness and rigor in qualitative studies, similar to ensuring validity and reliability in quantitative studies. That concludes all of the new information for this video. Be sure to check Blackboard for Module 2 assignments and email us through course messages if you have any questions. Until next time.